Oh, the kids come up front. Uh, thank you for being here. Can you all hear me? This isn't on, is it? Don't, can everyone hear me all right, or is it too loud? No. Yeah, better? Better? Jesus. That's good. That's, they'll figure it out. That's great. Is that all right? All right. Thanks for coming. I appreciate this. Uh, I'm going to, since a couple of you have heard me read from this book at least twice, and maybe more than a couple, I'm going to try to uh, read something I hadn't, I'll read something I haven't before, at least in front of you, and I will uh, try to keep it brief. Uh, for those of you who uh, haven't, I'm just waiting for the crying children to settle down. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the book before I get to this chapter, which is toward the end. This is a book about this guy, Sam Pulsifer, who accidentally burns down the Emily Dickinson house in Amherst, Massachusetts. Goes to prison for it, uh, 10 years. He kills two people in the process. Uh, goes to prison for it, gets out, tries to start a new life, uh, and then finds out that there's a market for this kind of stuff, that other people want him to burn down other writers' homes in New England. Uh, and he refuses to do so, but these houses start going up in flames anyways. And he's got a bunch of letters that have been sent to him while he was in prison from people who want him to burn these houses down. And when these houses start going up in flames, or smoldering, or at least someone tries to set fire to them, he has to figure out who is doing it before he gets blamed for it. Uh, this is about the chapter I'm going to read, or the part of the chapter, is about two-thirds the way through the book. Um, he's received a letter from this guy named Peter LeClaire, uh, who lives in uh, New Hampshire, rural New Hampshire. And uh, this guy's one of these sort of taciturn Yankees who basically speaks by shrugging. Uh, he doesn't actually say anything most of the time. And he wants uh, Sam to burn down, the narrator's name is Sam Pulsiver, to burn down the Robert Frost place in New Hampshire. and. Uh, so they decide to go to the Robert Frost place so Sam can figure out why, for a number of convoluted reasons. Basically, I wanted to get the people in the house, so I made up a reason for them to get there. Um, I think that's about it. Sam is a packaging scientist. I think that comes into play here very briefly. And there's no swearing in this paragraph, <laughs> in this chapter, I don't think. Let me say now that between the then when this was happening and the, the now from which I'm writing, I've become something of a reader. Back then, I hadn't heard of the author who was inside the Robert Frost place, about to read from his most recent book, but I've heard of him now, and I've read all his novels, too. Each of his novels is populated by taciturn northern New Hampshire countrymen with violent tendencies, doing violent things to their country women and children, then brooding over the violence within them, and how the harsh northern New Hampshire landscape is part and parcel of that violence. Recently, the author moved to Wyoming to get away from the city folk who are moving to New Hampshire, and he's now setting his books in Wyoming, where the men are also taciturn and violent, etc. And the books have won a few awards, and they've been made into major motion pictures. I should say that, too. It was a good thing Peter and I arrived when we did, because we got two of the last available seats. I did a quick scan of the crowd for arsonists or potential arsonists, but I recognized no one, no one at all. There were a few women scattered around, but mostly the audience was composed of men. Some of the men were dressed like Peter and wore red plaid hunting jackets or bulky tan Carhartt jackets or lined flannel shirts, and all of these men's men were wearing jeans and work boots. Some of the men wore ski jackets and hiking boots and the sort of many pocketed army green pants that made you want to get up out of your seat and repel. Some of the men wore wide whale corduroy pants and duck boots and cable knit sweaters and scarves. It was a regular United Nations of white American manhood. But all the men, no matter what they were wearing, were slouching in their chairs with their legs so wide open that it seemed as though there must be something severely wrong with their testicles. In front of us all was a podium with a microphone sticking out of it. On the front of the podium, and all over the walls too, were posters announcing the reading and also announcing the reader's position as the current Robert Frost Place's writer in residence. There was a picture of the writer in residence on the poster, and from the picture I recognized him in person, sitting off to the right of the podium. He, too, was wearing a red plaid hunting jacket and had a big red beard and a pile of graying red curly hair. Sitting next to him was a thin bald man wearing wire rim glasses and a yellow corduroy shirt so new that it looked as though it had just come out of the box. The thin bald man got up out of his chair, walked to the podium, and introduced himself as the director of the Robert Frost Place. He talked about the history of the Robert Frost Place writers in residence and how each writer in residence was chosen for the way he and his work embodied the true spirit of Robert Frost and of New England itself. The director then talked for a while about what exactly the true spirit of New England was. I can't say I listened to all or any of what he said, the way you don't really listen to those car commercials when they tell you how their vehicle embodies the true spirit of America. 
Anyway, this all went on for a while, and at some point he must have actually introduced the writer in residence because the director suddenly sat down, there was some applause, and the writer in residence took his place at the podium. He took a bottle of Jim Beam, the size and shape of a hip flask, out of his jacket pocket and took a pull from it, and then without saying a word of thanks to us for coming, did I thank you for coming? <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry. He began to read. The story was about a wood pile and the snow falling on the wood pile, and the old man who owned the wood pile, who actually wasn't that old, but would have been so beaten down by life that he looked old. The old man was sitting at his kitchen window, drinking bourbon straight from the bottle, and watching the snow wet the wood that he and his family needed for their heat, and that needed to be chopped pronto. His son was supposed to chop the wood. The son had promised, but he was off somewhere getting into trouble with a girl the old man didn't much care for because she was a slut. She was a slut, it seemed, not because she'd actually had sex with someone or someone's, because who else but a slut would date the old man's son? The old man hated the girl, and he hated the son, and he hated the snow, and he hated the unchopped wood, which was clearly some sort of symbol of how the man's life hadn't worked out the way he planned, and the old man hated the bourbon, too, which he kept drinking anyways. I couldn't understand why the old man didn't just get up off his ass and chop the wood himself, and I also couldn't understand why the author didn't use metaphors or...